In this lecture, we're going to look at the developing understanding of the church, uh, particularly in the third century. It's very interesting that Northern Africa produced more than its share of important Christian theologians. The first we're going to look at in this lecture is Tertullian of Carthage, the father of Latin theology, the first to write in Latin. He's actually the one who coined the term Trinity, Trinitas, to describe the threeness and oneness in God. Then there's Cyprian of Carthage, very important for understanding the doctrine of the church. And then eventually, Augustine of Hippo, also from Northern Africa. We begin with Tertullian of Carthage. He lived from about 155 to about 240. And the first thing I want to say about this uh, high-class individual, his full name was Quintus Septimius Florens Tertullianus. He seems to have been a lay theologian rather than a pastor or a bishop. Some think that he was a lawyer. And he definitely brings a legal, if not a legalistic, perspective to his writing and his thought. He was a very intense individual, a zealot, uh, expressed himself very forcefully, and he's very strict about Christian behavior. Uh, and this moralism, this strong moralism, is very typical of the third century. And you might wonder, why isn't he called Saint Tertullian? Well, I'm glad you asked. Uh, you might notice this uh, icon around the internet. I've seen it a lot lately. People, this is fake news. Okay, it is the alternative facts of church history. First of all, Tertullian, he's rarely depicted at all in Christian art. Secondly, he never has a halo because he's not a saint. And third, if you could read this really low quality image, this forgery, you would see that the Greek says Hagias Andreas, Saint Andrew. Fake. Tertullian is not a saint because later in life he joined the Montanist sect. And this schismatic group believed in direct prophecies from the Holy Spirit, although they had to be judged according to the regula fidei. Uh, we talked about that in the last lecture. They had uh, a belief in the imminent millennium, a millennial kingdom, and it was ultra strict in terms of morality, Christian behavior. They had a very negative view of marriage and the enjoyment of the world, They're pretty much down on any kind of pleasure at all. They were no fun at parties. And for Tertullian, holiness, purity, is really the most important mark of the church. And the Catholic Church was just too soft on sinners for Tertullian's liking. And he left to join this strict puritanical unforgiving group called the Montanists. And you can see this in Tertullian's views on baptism. By the third century, there is agreement in the church that baptism remits all of the sins that had gone before, any sins that you might be born with, original sin, plus any sins that you committed before your baptism. However, it's not so clear about sins that you commit after baptism. Basically, you're just not supposed to sin after you're baptized. And I'm not really exaggerating there. Certain grave offenses like murder, adultery, apostasy, denying the faith, they were considered to be sins unto death in line with 1 John 5, 16 and 17. And many in the church considered them unforgivable after baptism. And you might know that uh, the Emperor Constantine delayed his baptism until he was on his deathbed. And this is very common in the, in the era because of this view that sins committed after baptism can't be forgiven. So you better get all your sinning in before you get baptized. And if you're the emperor, well, there's a whole lot of sinning involved in that job. So that's, you know, you could see why the emperor would want to delay his baptism uh, until the very end. Now, Tertullian is also aware that Christian parents baptize their infant children, but he is not in favor of this. He urges putting it off because of this view that 
any sins committed after baptism can't be forgiven. This is also the reason for Tertullian's departure from the Catholic fold. In 218, Pope Calixtus decrees that Christians who committed sexual sins or murder after they've been baptized can be received back into the church after some appropriate penance or public repentance. Now, an influential priest in Rome by the name of Hippolytus says, no way, not going to happen. He thought this is just terribly lax. In fact, he sets himself up as a rival bishop of Rome. Now, he was later on reconciled with Rome, and he died a martyr, and now he's actually called Saint Hippolytus, interestingly enough. But Tertullian sides strongly with Hippolytus and these other hardliners. Tertullian then later joins the sect of the Montanus, and then very ironically, Tertullian, the father of Latin theology, dies outside the Catholic fold. Tertullian was famous for his saying that the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. In other words, the more you try to kill us, the more you persecute us, the more the church will grow and thrive. And people love that quote, but there's a flip side to that. There's a dark side to that quote because it encourages a heroic ecclesiology, the one where only the heroes of the faith are good Christians. And this heroic view of Christianity is still around today. And ironically, it is this insistence on heroic purity that drives Tertullian outside of the Catholic Church. And by the way, here, Catholic you shouldn't confuse that term Catholic with what later becomes a very centralized Roman church in the Middle Ages. Catholic here means the mainstream church, the universal church. So to summarize Tertullian, uh, to redefine the standards of Christian behavior in Tertullian's mind is to redefine the church itself. So for Tertullian, the church is really a system of morality. This is very interesting if you think about that in terms of the New Testament, because it seems like the Pharisees viewed the church as a system of morality. Secondly, the gospel itself for Tertullian sounds a lot like what Dallas Willard called the gospel of sin management. But keep in mind the context. Tertullian's views were not that far from the norm at that time, and also the different lifestyle of the Christian church was one part of what we would today call its missional character. It's what attracted people to the church. So things are very complicated. Now on to Cyprian of Carthage and his context, remember I said how context is very important in this class, his context is the Decian persecution, the persecution of the Roman Emperor Decius in the years 249-250. All inhabitants of the Roman Empire were required to offer a sacrifice at a pagan temple on behalf of the emperor, not to the emperor, he didn't sacrifice to the emperor because living emperors were not yet gods. They were only granted divinity by an act of the Senate after they were dead. One very droll emperor by the name of uh, Vespasian said on his deathbed, I think I'm becoming a god. Now, in the face of this persecution, Christians had four options about what they could do. First of all, they could just go ahead and sacrifice. Just apostatize. If you did so, you would get a receipt that you had done so. The authorities would issue you a certificate called a libellus. And uh, you can see this is an actual libellus from the time, proving that you had sacrificed on behalf of the emperor. Or you could pretend to sacrifice. Lie. Maybe you could get a forged libellus or pay somebody a bribe to get a libellus when you hadn't, in fact, sacrificed. You could maybe get one on eBay, Egypt Bay. Professor David Steinmetz used to quote Mark Twain, a lie is an abomination before the Lord and a very present help in time of trouble. Or you could flee.
But the choice most honored by the church was to be a confessor, that is, to steadfastly refuse to offer sacrifice because of your Christian faith. And persons who did so were called confessors, that is, those who survived. Those who were put to death were called martyrs, and that was even better because then you were venerated by the church. Now, the result of confessing and, and being steadfast varied. Your results could vary. It depended on the local authorities. It could mean torture. It could mean you'd be imprisoned. It could mean that you would be put to death. Or sometimes it could mean nothing would happen to you at all if the local authorities thought Decius was a nut job. Now, it's a difficult choice. It's not all black and white because generally the church thought you should be willing to die for your faith rather than deny Christ. And this follows from what Jesus says in Matthew chapter 10. Whoever acknowledges me before others, I will also acknowledge before my Father in heaven. But whoever disowns me before others, I will disown before my Father in heaven. So you, now you, maybe you can understand why people did not want to readmit people into the church because they believed that Christ had disowned them. But many people did sacrifice or lie or flee. And this leads to a huge controversy in the church and divisions in the church because some pastors wanted to readmit people who had either pretended to apostatize or who had bought fake certificates, and in some cases, even those who had sacrificed back into the church. And these fallen Christians were called the lapsed, or in Latin, the lapsi. The more gracious and forgiving leaders in the church said, let the lapsi come home, lapsi come home. Sorry, that was a very bad joke, very bad. And yet I left it in. At the other extreme was a priest in Rome by the name of Novatius. And he said that the lapsed cannot be readmitted. They are no longer Christians. And they can't even become Christians again. Some of Cyprian's own presbyters, on the other hand, were more lenient. And they want to readmit the lapsed with fairly minimal public repentance. And complicating these matters are these confessors, these spiritual heroes who did not back down in the face of persecution, those who survived and were not put to death, and who were venerated and revered by the people. These confessors, they took it upon themselves to vouch for many of the laughs, and they issued their own libelli, their own certificates, affirming their support of these fallen individuals. But then this creates a real problem of authority in the church. Who has the right? Who has the right to readmit people back into fellowship? Is it these local heroes of the faith, the confessors, or is it the bishop? Cyprian says only the bishop has the right to admit people back into the church. Now, the recent movie Silence came out at the end of 2016 based on the amazing novel by Shusako Endo. I read this novel maybe 25 years ago, and it still engages my mind. I'm still wrestling with the issues of that novel. It brings these issues to life and brings them home. I highly recommend that you see this movie. Uh, watch this movie. It's directly related to the issues of the Novation Schism that we're talking about now and to the Donatist controversy, which we'll be considering in our next lecture. As a direct result of the persecutions, a schism breaks out in the church. It's called the Novation Schism after a priest by the name of Novation. And for over a year, the seat of the Bishop of Rome had been left vacant because of the persecutions of the Emperor Decius. And finally, after over a year, Pope Cornelius was elected. A man by the name of Cornelius was elected Bishop of Rome, and his view was that the lapsed, the fallen, can be readmitted into the church, into the church's fellowship, after an appropriate period of repentance, public penance. By the way, you can visit Pope Cornelius's relics if you're ever in Aachen, Germany. You can visit his skull, which is housed in this reliquary. Alternatively, if you're in Rome, you can visit his other skull, which is housed in this church. Now, Cyprian supports Cornelius, even though Cornelius is much more lax than Cyprian's own views regarding letting people into the church again after 
being fallen after falling. He supports the new pope because he's very big on the unity of the church. But Novation, angry at Cornelius's election, has himself elected as a rival bishop of Rome by his followers, and they form a schismatic group. The Novation sect continues for at least two centuries. Another conflict also arose, the rebaptism controversy. Cyprian had argued that people who had been baptized by schismatic priests and bishops had to be rebaptized. Why? Because they were baptized outside the true church. And there is no baptism outside the true church. That was the same argument that Tertullian had used before, previously. He said the same thing about earlier schismatic groups. Their baptism was no true baptism. And that's a common viewpoint in Africa. In Rome, however, rebaptism was strongly condemned and rejected. So the Bishop Stephen of Rome, Stephen or Stephen, who was Pope from 254 to 257, he disagreed sharply with Cyprian on this issue. And ultimately, Stephen's view prevailed and is still the position of the Roman Catholic Church and many other churches, by the way. It became an issue again in the Reformation when Lutherans and the Reformed and Anglicans, they refused to rebaptize people. They believe that the baptism of the Roman Church is true baptism, while the Anabaptists insist on rebaptism. So it's a major difference in ecclesiology and their view of the sacraments. Now, Cyprian's role in these controversies had a lasting impact on ecclesiology and the church's understanding of itself. One thing that's very interesting about Cyprian is that he's willing to compromise for the sake of unity in the church. Because Cyprian, at least in his earlier days, was very strict. He was very sympathetic to the hardline views of Novation. But he compromised with his own lenient presbyters who allowed the lapsed to be readmitted uh, after a demonstration of their repentance. Even those who had actually offered sacrifice on behalf of the emperor could be reconciled, but only on their deathbed only at the point of death. And that's still pretty strict. Now, Cyprian could not convince Rome on the issue of rebaptizing those who came from schismatic communities, but he continued to be in communion with the Bishop of Rome. So that shows his spirit of compromise for the sake of unity. Second, Cyprian asserted the authority of the bishop to allow people back into the church, not the authority of the confessors, those spiritual superheroes that we talked about. You might also notice in your reading that he makes arguments about apostolic succession from Peter, considered to be the first bishop of Rome, a role that is later called the Pope. And most importantly, the unity of the church is more important than church purity. Therefore, schism is a worse offense than apostasy. And this issue will come up again 1,200 years later in the time of the Reformation when Roman Catholics accused the Reformers of schism. In any case, Cyprian contributes a strong ecclesiology to the Christian tradition. Two important statements of Cyprian. He says in his treatise on the unity of the church, You cannot have God for your father unless you have the church for your mother. The reformer John Calvin will later quote this line of Cyprian in his Institutes of the Christian Religion. The Christian faith, in other words, is not a solitary individual matter. Christ redeems, guides, and sanctifies a community, not merely individuals. And then there's the line that follows in the treatise. If you could escape outside Noah's Ark, you could escape outside the church. Or, as Cyprian puts it in a letter, extra ecclesiam nulla salus. That is, there is no salvation outside the church. And this becomes a near universal Christian principle, although you can interpret it in a number of different ways. 
For example, in the time of the Reformation, the Roman Catholics will claim that you have to be in communion with Rome in order to be saved. But the Reformers, on the other hand, say that the Church is defined differently than merely the external institution. Now, in our next lecture, we will turn to another great African theologian, Augustine of Hippo. Until next time.